Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I am so glad to be here this evening. Always glad to be in the presence of the Lord. And I'm always grateful to Him for giving me this opportunity. It's a privilege. It's a privilege to know the Lord. There are a lot of people out there that are suffering under heavy burden that are in distress and yet they do not know the Lord. Let's not take it for granted that we know Him. It is a privilege to know the Lord. Praise the Lord. And when we begin to understand the privilege that we have in Him, it should put compassion in our heart to reach out to those people that don't know Him. Because we are not better than those people, we're just privileged. So if those people too are permitted to know the Lord that we know, their life will not be the same again. And they can also enjoy what we are enjoying now in the Lord. May the Lord help us Amen. to always be prepared to go and reach out to those people suffering and let them know who God is. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We're going to continue our teaching this evening on the new man. The new man. I think this is teaching number three on that. And as we read in Matthew chapter 10, 24 to 25, we discovered that according to the word of the Lord, a disciple is not above his master, and a servant is not above his Lord. 25 says, it is enough for the disciple that he be as his master, and the servant as his Lord. Therefore, we begin to know that we cannot cut a shortcut around what Jesus had to do when he was here on earth. We have to do it the same way that he did it to get the results that he got. The new man that we're talking about today is the life that Christ gave to us. This life is not our own. It's the one that Christ gave to us because we know that our old man is dead, buried with Christ, crucified. If there's anybody here that you missed the initial series of the teaching, I want you to go and check those teachings on YouTube. The teachings that says, who am I? I want you to listen to everything because you will understand that once you've given your life to Jesus, you don't belong to yourself anymore. In fact, your, the, the self that you are is supposed to be dead and crucified with Christ. And the life that we are now living is the life of Christ that he gave to us. All of us. He gave us part of him. Praise the Lord. Now we want to know that this new life that we have in Christ Jesus, how do we live it? Because we have responsibilities. It doesn't come automatically. We can't just sit there and say, well, I have the life of Christ and then let everything just play out. Because when Jesus was here, he didn't just sit down and things played out for him. He did some things. And it's those things that he did that we're studying now. So that we can understand what we need to do to work the work of God and to live on this earth as Jesus Christ did. Because the Bible says, as he is, so are we in this world. Praise the Lord. So we started to talk about the issue of prayer. That's where we started. Even though I, I gave us four things. Prayer, fasting, Holy Ghost, and the Word. Because you, those four things, they just work together. But we're discussing about prayer now, which we started last Thursday. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. One, I want to start, I'm going to list it now so that it's easy for us to follow. So we can write this down. Why must we pray? Because we're going to see what Jesus Christ accomplished by prayer. Which if we want right now, we won't get it if we do not pray. 
He started his ministry with prayer and he ended it with prayer. The one thing is that he prayed and the Holy Spirit came upon him. That was the first thing that we, he did. We talked about that last Thursday, so we don't need to open to it, but in Luke chapter 3, 21 to 22, the Bible says that when he was baptized, he prayed. And as he was praying, the sky opened up and the Holy Spirit, like a dove, descended upon him. Most of us, when we relate to this scripture, we always say, oh, as Jesus was being baptized, the heaven opened to him and the dove came down. But no, when I did research in the word of God, I realized that the Holy Spirit did not come when he was being baptized. He was baptized. Then, as he was praying, the Holy Spirit came upon him. Praise the Lord. So if there's anybody here, you really desire the Holy Spirit, you need to pray. And if you pray, it's going to come. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Number two. As the Spirit came upon him, the Bible says he was led into the wilderness. We also did that last week. He was led into the wilderness. We can only be led by prayer. The Bible says as many as are led by the Spirit of the Lord, they are the children of the Lord. But it doesn't come automatically. And that's why we make mistakes. Because if, we, if it comes automatically, we shouldn't be making any mistake. If we want to be led by the Spirit of the Lord, we must pray. And that is why Jesus Christ spent most of his ministry time praying. Because he knew that he could achieve nothing without prayer. Because whatever he does, he must see the Father doing it. When he sees the Father doing it, or when he hears instruction, then he does it. And that's the only time we can have victory. Praise the Lord. So he was led into the wilderness. And we saw that when he was led into the wilderness, he was there for 40 days and 40 nights. Also fasting and praying. Because the temptation did not start until after the 40 days and 40 nights. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Also last week we read John 5.19 and John 5.30. Where Jesus Christ said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of his own self. So number three is, He lived his life by instruction. That's number three. By instruction. He was led. The number three, he was instructed. And the instruction came because of prayer. God will not come to you and instruct you if you do not come to the place of prayer. God will not come to you and have an audience with you if you do not come to him in prayer. Praise the Lord. First John I mean, John 5.30 says, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. Because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which sends me. Jesus lived by instruction because of prayer. So we must pray to receive the Holy Ghost. We must pray to be led. We must pray to be instructed. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Number four, he overcame temptation. He overcame temptation because of prayer. He was in the wilderness 40 days and 40 nights praying before the, the devil came to tempt him. And by the reason of the prayer he already prayed, he overcame Satan. When we see ourselves being overcome by temptation, it's a result of a prayerless life. Because temptation will come. But if we are prayerful, we will overcome temptation, just as Jesus Christ overcame temptation. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And we see that in the book of Luke, chapter 3. We read that last Thursday, so I'm, going to, I'm not going to go over it. Number five, by prayer, he was empowered. Praise the Lord. Tell your neighbor, you can be empowered. You can be empowered. 
the power of God is still the same today. And we can be empowered if, if we stay enough in the place of prayer. Because the Bible says after Jesus Christ was baptized, he was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. He was there 40 days and 40 nights. He was tempted. He overcame. And verse 14 says, Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee and there and there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. This is Luke 4, 14. Luke 4, 14. When he came out of the wilderness, he returned. But when he returned, he did not return the same way that he went. Because, remember, he was living in Galilee long before this time. There was nobody heard about him. The fame of him did not go anywhere until he returned from the wilderness with power. We can return also. We can return from the place of prayer with power. But before we can return, we have to be there. Praise the Lord. Amen. So prayer it brings empowerment to do the will of God. Praise God. Amen. Number six. Jesus Christ was consecrated to obey God and to say yes to God even when his soul did not want to do it. So, let, we can call that consecration or submission. Prayer brings us to a place of consecration, to a place of submission. Because I want to tell you something. There is nobody that it's easy for to live right. I'm talking about human beings right now. You look at some people and you say, well, I mean, God has gifted them to do the right thing. That's why they are doing the right thing. That's not true. They consecrated themselves. And it doesn't matter how bad our life is. By prayer, our life can be consecrated to submit to the will of God and to desire to do the will of God against our flesh. Praise the Lord. <coughs> Hallelujah. You're working on number six. Okay. Praise God. Let's read Matthew 26. I mean, when we get home, we can read from the old chapter, but I'm just going to pick some verses out of here to see how prayer can help you. When you see yourself struggling with some issues in your life, it is time to pray. Because prayer will put you over and bring you to a pleasant place where you begin to do the will of God. Even it might seem difficult, but it is possible. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm going to start reading from verse 36 of Matthew 26. Then come Jesus with them into a place called Gethsemane. This is towards the end of the ministry of Jesus Christ. And said unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Jesus was sorrowful and very heavy because he knew that the time for him to die was very near. But he really didn't want to die. And what you have to realize is that God wouldn't have forced Jesus Christ to die if he chose not to die. Because he said, I choose to lay down my life and to pick it up again. So he knew that he needed to bring himself in alignment with the will of his father. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's see verse 38. Then said he unto them, he told them the way he was feeling. He said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. That's how, have you seen somebody that is so sorrowful unto death? 
you know, it's, it's a deep sorrow. It's when people are mourning their loved ones, you know, some, some, sometimes they get so sorrowful that they wish they were dead. That was the situation where Jesus was at that time. And let's see what he did in verse 39. He went a little further, fell on his face, and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. It was prayer that brought Jesus Christ to the point where he actually agreed with the Father, both his soul and his spirit and his flesh. And if you continue to read on, you, you will realize that Jesus Christ went three times. He went to pray the first time he came back. Why did he? Did we think that he just did the three times because he wanted to go three times? Because the work was not completed yet. He knew that he, he has not reached the point where he wanted to reach. He continued to go back to pray until he was in alignment with the will of God. And that is what we need to do. We cannot do without prayer. We continue to pray. If there is something that is challenging you, you know it's not the will of God in your life. If you pray today, you're still there today. Pray tomorrow. Pray the next day. Pray again and pray again and pray until it is gone. Because prayer, we do it. Praise the Lord. Let's see verse 40. He commented unto the disciples. He findeth them asleep. Is that not what we do? If we were like Jesus Christ, when those challenges come to us, we will be so frustrated and depressed, we will be sleeping. That is why events overtake us. Because we are sleeping when we are supposed to be praying. Jesus Christ did not sleep. He prayed because he knew what was at stake. Our life was at stake. The whole humankind was at stake. We need to begin to realize that a lot of things is at stake when we don't do the right thing. I mean, when God started to speak to me about that, he made, he made me to yield to God more. Because sometimes you think that whether you do the right thing or not affects only you. It is not true. Because if you are a child of destiny, there are several lives that is attached to your own. And when you don't do the right thing, it does not only affect you, it affects those other people. And you will give an account to God. May God not require of the blood of a man from your hand. That's what I'm saying tonight. We must pray. And look at what Jesus Christ told them in verse 41. Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. You know, we are all quick to quote this scripture. We quote it in a way that is it, it, it's, uh, favorable to us. You tell people, well, I mean, God knows I want to do it. I mean, my spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's not what Jesus Christ is saying here. Jesus Christ was telling them that their spirit is willing, the flesh is weak, but it is prayer that we bring their flesh in subjection to their spirit to make their flesh to do what it needs to do. But they did not realize that they were praying. They were sleeping. Do you know that Peter's life almost was sucked out because of that? Thank God because Jesus Christ prayed for him. He said, I prayed for you that your faith does not fail you. Because when he was supposed to be praying, he was not praying. Thank God for Jesus. He prayed and prayed the more 
and prayed the bone until he got to where he needed to get to. Praise the Lord. Because after he won them, he said, why are you sleeping? This is not the time to sleep. He went again. The Bible says the second time he prayed. The same prayer. He said, oh my father, if this cup may not pass from me except I drink it, thy will be done. He needed to subject his flesh to the will of God. He didn't want to die because he said, if possible, if possible, let me not drink it. The flesh lost against the spirit. That's what the Bible says. The things that God wants us to do, our flesh doesn't want to do it. When it's time to pray, the flesh wants to sleep. If the same time you are praying and sleeping, when they turn the TV on, the sleep will not come anymore. That's true. You go to Bible, you go for a prayer meeting, while you are there, you sleep through. As soon as you, the prayer meeting is over and you just sing with your friend, you are not sleepy anymore. But it is that prayer that we are sleeping in that will help us to overcome that flesh. We must pray. Praise the Lord. And then he came and found them sleeping again <laughs> because their eyes were heavy. And the Bible says the third time in verse 44, he went away and said the same thing the third time. And then verse 45, he was already done. He knew. When you pray through, you will know. You will know when you pray through. Because Jesus Christ knew in verse 45, he, comes, he came to this disciple and told them, he said, sleep on now. Take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand. He already knew. He, 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 he was ready to do what he needed to do. But what would have happened if he didn't pray? And when we go to read some other uh, 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 gospel where this was recorded, there were places where he said that he, he was so much in agony that he was sweating blood. That is the kind of agony that Jesus was in because the will of God must be done. So, when you say that you want to do the will of God, have you prayed until you are sweating blood to do it? Because some of us, we give excuses. We say, I have tried. I've tried. And you know, God knows my heart. Yes, God knows your heart. You have not tried enough. Because if you pray enough, prayer will take you over. God is able to make us to do what he wants us to do. But he will not force us. We have to be willing and we need to do what we need to do to get there. Just as our Savior Jesus Christ. Because if it comes easy, Jesus would, shouldn't need to go through those kind of distress. He should just stand up and say, the hour is come. Come and kill me. Nobody wants to die. But when we tarry in the place of prayer, doing the will of God becomes easy for you. So if there's somebody here, you are struggling with the will of God. Anything that the Bible says you should do, you can't do it. It's time for prayer. It is time for prayer. Because prayer will take you over. And we make you do what your flesh does not want to do. You will look at yourself and you yourself you will be amazed. Say, uh -uh, is this me? Yes, because the power of God will come to make you do the right thing when you stay in the place of prayer. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Number seven. Prayer will make us to overcome in the time of distress and desperation. Prayer. And you see, the time that we need to pray most, that's when we don't feel like praying. 
any time you are so sad and so down that you don't feel like praying, go and pray. I'm telling you. Because that is the only thing that will take you out of that situation. Hallelujah. Luke 22 verse 44. This is Luke's account of what happened at the Garden of Gethsemane. Verse 44. He says, And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Look, he was praying already. He was praying already. You know, because some of us, when we are going through a situation in our life, we come up to a point. You say, what do you want me to do again? I have prayed. I have fasted. Have you had people tell you stories? I'm sure I have said that too before. <laughs> you know, when you are going through some difficult situation, you will come up to a point. You say, uh-uh, I have prayed. I have fasted. I have waited on the Lord. What else do you want me to do? I will give you an answer today. Pray more. Because at this point, Jesus was already praying. He has already prayed several times. And verse 44 says, being in agony again, he still prayed. He did not stop praying because of agony. And said, ah, does this God want to kill me? We will pray in season and out of season. And after we must have prayed, and we are still in agony, we pray more. Because when we pray, the answer will come. The only reason that we don't get answer to our prayer is because we don't continue to pray. And we're still going to get there. If you pray and you continue to pray and you don't stop praying, the answer will come. I don't know how long you need to pray. That's the question I cannot answer. Because the Bible didn't tell us how long in terms of days or hours or months. What the Bible says is that continue to pray until the answer comes. That's what the Bible says. Praise the Lord. And we will see that when Jesus prayed like that, the Bible says God sent angels to minister to him. God sent angels to minister to him. So let us not think that we are too weak to pray. When you have prayed, pray the more and pray and pray more. God will give you grace. That's why the Bible says they that wait upon the Lord, they will renew their strength. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and they will not faint. Prayer can never make you weary. Prayer can never make you faint. The Bible says the young men, they will fail and utterly fall. Do you know that young men, they are the strongest? When you are young, that's when you are the strongest and men are stronger than women. So young men are strongest. But Bible says that when you wait upon the Lord, your strength surpasses those of the young men. Because you will exchange your strength for that of Jehovah. Praise the Lord. Number eight. Prayer will bring us to many victories. Many victories. Many victories. If we are experiencing failures, we have not prayed enough. When we pray enough, we will have victories. Praise the Lord. Matthew 18 from 14 to 21. A lot of people quote this scripture too. And um, I'm going to let you know what Jesus was trying to say in this passage. From verse 14, it says, And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is lunatic and so vexed. For often time he falleth into the fire 
and offer into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. The disciples of Jesus Christ did not obtain victory when it comes to this lunatic. They did not because they tried to kill him and they could not kill him. Now, let's see what Jesus said. Jesus answered and said, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him to me. You remember Jesus did not say, oh, okay, the reason why you couldn't do it is because, you know, this one is too difficult for you to handle. It is the one that I, Jesus, can handle. That's not what he said. He said, you faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I live with you to learn to know how to get victories? And then, of course, they brought the, the man to Jesus Christ and he rebuked the devil and the devil departed from the child. And the Bible says the child was cured that very hour. That very hour. That very hour. Of course, the, the, the disciples were quiet. They waited until the, the, the people left and then they went to Jesus and said, okay, why is it that we tried and we didn't have victory concerning this matter? Verse 20. Jesus said unto them, Because of your own belief, for verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall be removed. And nothing shall be impossible unto you. We normally say with God all things are possible. But with you, with you, if you have faith, all things are possible. That's what the Bible says. It says, nothing shall be impossible unto you. Now, verse 21 says, how be it? This kind goeth not by fasting and praying. But by, but by fasting and praying. You know, Jesus Christ was not telling them that when they bring such type of situation to them, they should go and fast and pray. That's not what Jesus Christ was telling them. Jesus Christ was telling them is, if you are prayed up, if you are fasted up, those things will not defeat you. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because people now look at this and say, okay, what Jesus is saying that when certain things come your way, then those things are so powerful that you have to fight them with prayer and, and fasting. That's not what Jesus Christ is saying. Jesus Christ was telling the disciples that you need to live a prayer life. You need to live a fasting life because when you pray continuously and fast continuously, your faith will be strong enough to deal with issues when they come. We don't need to wait for issues to come before we can go and get the power to deal with it. Because that's what we try to do. When we have challenges, then we want to go and work up some powers. It does not work like that. Prayer. When we continue in prayer as Jesus Christ continued in prayer, and we continue in fasting as he continued in fasting, when unexpected challenges come our way, we will be victorious over it. But when we don't pray, we don't fast, we just enjoy our life the way we want it, when challenges come, we cannot handle this because we don't have faith. We are full of doubt and fear. And when we have doubt and fear, we can never have faith. And when we don't have faith, we can't get results. So, why is it that Jesus Christ got victories in, in all he's doing in the ministry? Because he was always praying. He wake up in the morning, he's praying. In the afternoon, he's praying. In fact, he prays all night. While people are sleeping and enjoying their sleep, he's praying. 
And guess what? He was not paying for himself. I mean, may God give us understanding. <laughs> you know, in these days when you call a prayer meeting, if that prayer meeting is not for people to come and pray for themselves and all their enemies, they will not attend. Yes, if you say, oh, come and pray, let's pray for the kingdom to come. And they'll say, okay. They'll be in their house. Kingdom come. Hey, let kingdom come. Eh? I have my own problem. You are talking about the kingdom. But it does not work like that. When we busy ourselves with the things of God, God busy himself with our things. Praise the Lord. So prayer will give us many, many victories. Even when challenges that ordinarily it, it, it looks like it cannot, we can't topple over it. We will. When we are prayed up. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Number nine. Prayer will bring us to a point where we will see the glory of God. Prayer will bring us to a point where we will see the glory of God. We read this last Thursday, Luke 9, 28 to 29. The Bible says, and it came to pass, about an eighth day after these things, he took Peter, John, and James and went up into a mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered. And his raiment was white and glistering as he prayed. I don't even know if Jesus knew it was going to happen like that on that mountain. Because it was his manner to always go to pray. You understand? But this time around, God decided to reveal his glory to the disciples. And we know that the Bible says Moses was there, Elijah was there, they were talking. But it happened because Jesus was praying. It did not happen automatically. It was not like Jesus was with his disciples and then Elijah and Moses just appeared and his raiment started to change. It happened in the place of prayer. When we want to see the glory of God, we will see the glory of God in the place of prayer. And some of you might be saying, okay, what is my business with the glory of God now? <laughs> Yeah, because you say, well, my problems, let me solve my problem first. You're talking about the glory. The glory of God will take away your problem. Amen. When we seek him and he appears to us, he, he will take care of every other mundane thing that is in our life. That is what we don't realize. He's more than enough. He's more than enough. He's more than enough. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So we have listed nine things. And of course, we are not exhausting this because we are not teaching about prayer now. We are just scratching the surface. We, we have, we're still going to have a series of teachings on prayer. That's not what we're doing right now. So I'm going to stop there and move on. Jesus Christ prayed so much that he got to, up to a point that the disciples said, ah, ah. This man is always praying. We are his disciple. We must pray too. So they went to him and said, okay, teach us. Teach us. We want to know how to pray. I want us to go through the Lord's Prayer. Luke 11 from 1 to 4. I mean, it's a shame that <laughs> in those days, I mean, the Anglican churches, Methodist churches and all that, they will say the Lord's Prayer. But they just recite it, you know, they just take the book and recite it. They're not thinking about it. But now we Pentecostal, we don't recite it. We have forgotten all about it. And a lot of people are now publishing prayer books, how to pray, how to kill your enemy, send messages to those people chasing you, and things like that. And then you read all those prayer books, it does not line up with the word of God. And then we say God does not answer prayer. We have to do it the way Jesus did it. Because 
it is enough for a disciple to be like his master. Uh-huh. We are we cannot be greater than him and choose to pray our own prayer. Luke 11, 1 to 4. Say, and it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, they watched him. That's what they do. They watch him praying. And then when he finished praying, one of the disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray too. So that then he said, because John also taught his disciples to pray. We were trying to tell him, we want to pray too. And then he started to teach them. Let's see what the Lord taught them. And he said unto them, When ye pray, say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Come and worship him. You know, some people think worship is a waste of time. When you fix the time for a meeting, they will calculate how many minutes for the praise and worship, and they will make sure they walk him just at the tail end of the praise and worship. <laughs> It is important to worship God. That's why we are created. To worship Him. And then, Jesus said, Say, Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. That is the first prayer request. And thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, like I said, we are not teaching about prayer today. Because we need to know what the kingdom is why he has to come and for the will of God to be done on earth as it is in heaven. But what I want to point out today, even though we're not breaking that down, is that when you come to God for prayer, you first of all address the body in the mind of God. You know, when we come to God in prayer, we come bringing our needs. We don't care. In fact, we don't think that God has any need. So when we come to him, you just say, oh, Father, yes, I need this, I need that, I need this, I need that. And then you come again. Remember I told you yesterday, I need this, I need that. that. But Jesus Christ said, when you come, the first thing you should do is, God, whatever is in your mind, let it be done. That's the first prayer point. Thy kingdom come, that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Before you go to give us this day our daily bread. Because I know we know that very well. We all pray for it. But before we pray for God to give us our daily bread, let's first of all pray that what God wants done on earth should be done. Because somebody must pray for it to come to pass. And when Jesus was spending all those time praying, do you know what he was praying? Thy kingdom come will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what he was praying. He wasn't praying for him. Praying for himself. Praise the Lord. So we want to change our pattern of prayer. When you come to God, worship him and pray. And when you begin to pray like that, do you know what happens? God will start to share his body with you. God, we start, God still talk to people. I mean, some of us think that the, the, the day that God talk to people is gone. It's not. Do you know that when Jesus, when God wanted to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, he discussed with Moses. I mean, he discussed with Abraham. Why? Because Abraham was always conversing with him. When you start to pray the prayer, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And you are praying it genuinely. I'm not saying that, oh, and because Sister Fuki said we should say, Thy kingdom come. Let me say it before I ask my own. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> you know, when you really pray it with the body, and I know that for us to pray with the body, we need to understand the things of the kingdom, and we will still teach that. Because the things of the kingdom is more important than every other thing that we see today. What we see today is temporal. And God concerns him with his kingdom. He concerns himself with the things of his kingdom. And he wants it to happen. Praise the Lord. So, 
as I was saying, when we begin to pray thy kingdom come, God will start to share his mind with you. He might tell you about what he plans to do concerning a city, concerning a nation, concerning somebody. He might say, you know that person there, is maybe somebody that everybody is running away from. When they see him coming from this angle, they, they take the other side because of the kind of light the person is living. God might send you to that person. And say, I want to touch that person. Go and tell them. But how can we hear that? When we, we just go to God with all our own problems, we are not open to hear him, to see what is in his mind. And when we develop a relationship up to, up to that point with God, you don't need to pray about your needs. They are met. And I have experienced it before. When I first gave my life to Christ, I was so zealous. I, just, I never even thought about myself. You know? I, I prayed a lot, and when I pray, I never pray for myself. I, I didn't know how to do personal prayer <laughs> until recently. Yes, when they call and say, come and be praying for yourself. I don't know how to pray like that because I prayed what God wanted. But at that time, I did not lack anything. At that time, when I wasn't praying by myself, when I was, I didn't lack anything. And when I decide to do anything, if 10 people have gone through that pathway and nothing works for them, it will work for me. I'm just, I, that's just the truth. When I first gave my life, until I got distracted and a lot of things happened, but I thank God that I'm back. I'm back. Just as Peter. And Peter, Jesus said, I prayed for you. When you get restored, also restore your brethren. And that's what the Lord is sending me out to do. When we care about the things of God, we will never lack. In fact, your life will be so good that people will be envious about you. And they will say, why is your own always different? Because everything you go and do, and people will come and try what you are doing, it will not work for them. And then when, someone, when a group of people are doing some other things, it's not working, you get there, it works for you. You haven't even prayed about it. Because God is looking out for you, just as you are looking out for God. And God wants to bring us back to that. When the Bible says that my house shall be called the house of prayer to all the nation, it's not saying that we will come here and we'll be crying for our own needs. Because the Bible says in Matthew chapter 6, it says, God knows that you need those things. Don't be like the heathen that are running elder skelter for it. Don't do that. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So when the Bible says, my house shall be called the house of prayer, it's saying that when we come to the house of God, we begin to cry to him that he let your kingdom come and let your will be done. And when you busy yourself with the things of the kingdom, and God begins to use you to bring his kingdom to come to pass, he will bless you. Why was Abraham blessed in all things? The Bible says he was blessed in all things. Why? Because God found a man that he can use to bring to pass what he planned to do. Have you read the story of Jacob? Why was Jacob's life the way it was at the beginning? <laughs> he labored and labored and labored and he had nothing until he came to a point where he had to bow to God. And God said, don't worry. I have already declared that the blessing will flow through you to the rest. It has to come through him. But it, it will not come from the flesh or from the power of a man. May God give us understanding. Amen. And deliver us from mammon. <laughs> we are not teaching on mammon, but we are going to teach about mammon in this church. Because... I, God, have taught me and opened my eyes to a lot of things. 
a lot of things. And when Jesus Christ said, you cannot serve God and Mammon, there's a reason why he said it all. Do you know that there are several demons, there are a lot of demons that control a lot of things. He didn't talk about those ones. But why? You cannot serve Mammon and God. It's not possible. I don't care if somebody he came time to this room carrying fire on his head. If that person is serving Mamo, he is not serving God. And if he's doing miracles, I don't know the power he's using, but God knows. Because you cannot serve God and Mamo. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. So, then he now said, give us this day our daily bread. After we already dealt with the kingdom, we pray. Verse 4, forgive us our sin as we forgive everyone that has sinned against us. Please, if you have not forgiven people, don't pray that God should forgive you. Because the Bible already said, if you don't forgive, you will not be forgiven. And I don't care what they did to you. I am sorry. It's not like I, I don't understand. But that's what the Bible says. There is no excuse. It does not matter what they did. They must be forgiven. For you to be forgiven. And that's why Jesus Christ added it here. It's not automatic. He says, forgive us our sins. He, he, he didn't put a full stop there. For we also forgive everyone. For we. So if you don't forgive everyone, and if you say you forgive, and you are still praying for vengeance, you have not forgiven them. Because if you pray for vengeance over somebody that hurts you, you deserve to be punished for your sin also. Because the Bible says God will be merciful to the merciful. Mm -hmm. he, to be forward, for he will show himself forward. That is what the Bible says. So we should be careful when we begin to pray for judgment. No fire, fire. Because we all deserve to be judged. There is nobody here that is so perfect that you don't deserve to be judged. So if you now want God to forgive you your own sin, why should he not forgive that other person? Why? So when we pray, we should be careful to make sure we are praying and we are not causing ourselves. Because, and that is what the enemy is using to distract the church in this generation. People pray a lot, you know, they will come pray amazing, but when you get there, the kind of prayer that are being prayed. And what baffles me most is that these people, and I have done it myself, so hey, I'm not like saying some people, this, this is what I have done myself. But I have corrected myself. And that's why this teaching is going on today. Let us pray our right. Let us pray our right. Because we, we gather together, we pray, 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 and then we don't get results to our prayer. And that doesn't even tell us anything. We pray this year. The same prayer we pray this year, we go and pray next year, we pray there. But 10 years has gone by. We have not seen an answer. Why don't we ask ourselves, what is going on? Please, let us not go to God and say, God, let my enemy fall down and die. Because that enemy is not your enemy. Our enemy, we all have one common enemy, which is the devil. He only uses men. And this man that is using, if they have Christ and they know him, they won't be victims. Because I call them victims. They are victims that needs to be delivered. The Bible says God will that all men be saved. Mm. 
no matter how wicked they are because the wickedness that they are doing is coming from the evil spirit that is making them to do it if they are set free they will not do it anymore look at the look at Saul look at Saul before Saul gave his before Saul became poor was he not wicked do you know how many people he murdered he killed many people so what if God wanted to judge he should kill Saul but he was not judged God showed him mercy what we should just be praying is Father let your kingdom come because when your kingdom come these people that are in bondage they can be set free by prayer they can be set free by prayer they are our potential brethren when we bring them to the church they join force with us to destroy the works of the enemy let's not destroy Amen. them because when you destroy these people the devil that is working with them is still alive he will go and use somebody else you know, when he's using this person to afflict you, you pray that that person dies, that person dies, you will go to somebody else and use that person to afflict you, you pray, that person dies, you will go to somebody else. So it's not these people that are afflicting you, it's Satan that is using them. So let's all join our hands together and fight against Satan. Praise the Lord. May, the, may God give the church understanding to know that we all have a common enemy. And that is the common enemy we need to fight. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So that is the Lord's Prayer. And as we finish the Lord's Prayer, I'm going to transition us to the next part of this chapter. Because the Bible says that in verse 5, then teaching them more about prayer. He, he told them about the Lord's Prayer and then he started to teach them more about prayer. And let's see what Jesus Christ said. Because he used the parable this time. He used this illustration. He said, suppose you went to a friend's house at midnight. You wanted to borrow, borrow three loaves of bread. You would shout up to him, Hey, a friend of mine has just arrived from a visit and I have nothing to give him to eat. And then he would call out from his bedroom and say, please don't ask me to get up. The door is locked for the night. We are all in bed. I just can't help you this time. That's what the neighbor was telling. He said, I'm not going to come up and open the door. But let's see what happened. Verse 8. But I'll tell you this. Even though he won't do it as a friend, if you keep knocking long enough, he will get up and give you everything you want. Just because of your persistence. Are we hearing now? Are we hearing now what Jesus Christ was telling the disciples or and is still telling us today what prayer is you must be persistent in prayer you must be persistent and verse 9 says and so he says and so it is with prayer and so it is with prayer that is how prayer is Praise the Lord. Keep on asking and you will keep on getting. Keep on looking and you will keep on finding. Knock and the door will open unto you. Everyone who asks receive and all who seek find and the door will open to everyone who knocks. <laughs> Let me tell you something. The reason why we don't get results to our prayer is because we stop Jesus said we need to be persistent. I mean, if he, after telling them how to pray, he now told them this. It means this is very important. It means without this, we might not succeed in the place of prayer. He told them that parable and he said that is how prayer needs to be done. You knock and you don't leave the door until the door opens. Let me tell you something. If you go to somebody's house, and you are determined to enter the house and you continue to knock. Even if they are not home, if you continue to knock, they will come back and meet you there. Do you hear what I'm saying? 
they will come back and meet you there and they will open the door for you. That is how we need to treat prayer. Don't say, ah, I have not, my heart is paining me. I'm going home. Yes, go home. You will not get the answer. Oh, maybe I'm tired. You can never be tired in the place of prayer. You can never be fed up in the place of prayer. Because when you fed up, then you have said you don't want the answer. This is very important in prayer. You will pray until you get your answer. Because that is what Jesus Christ told us to do. And Jesus Christ said in verse 11, He said, You men who are fathers, if a boy asks you for bread, you will not give him stone. If he asks you for fish, you will not give him snake. And if he asks for egg, you will not give him scorpion. If you sinful persons know how to give your children what they need, don't you realize that your heavenly father will do at least as much? At least as much. God will answer our prayer. We just need to be persistent in praying. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Luke 18 verse 1 to 8. We'll stop on this chapter tonight. But this chapter is still reinforcing the last chapter that we read. It says, one day Jesus told the disciples a story to illustrate their need for constant prayer. To show them that they must keep praying until the answer comes. Brethren, we must keep praying until the answer comes. Now, I cannot tell you how long it's going to be. I cannot tell you if it's one day or two hours or three hours or one week. But the Bible says that you need to continue to pray until the answer comes. If your answer has not come, you continue to pray. Because if you continue to pray, the answer will come. The Bible says that that man stood up that night and he gave the neighbor the bread that the neighbor was asking for. Not because he loved the neighbor so much, but because the neighbor decided he will not leave. When we come to the place of prayer and we decide that we will not leave until we get an answer, we will get it. Amen. And that is how I want us to start to approach prayers. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Luke 18, from verse 1 to 8. Verse 2. He gave a parable. He said there was a, there was a city judge and he, and he said a very godless man who had great content for everybody. He was telling the story of a judge, a ruthless man that have no pity, doesn't care. And the Bible says a widow of the same city came to him frequently. It's not sometimes. He, she came frequently to appeal for justice against the man that harmed her. The judge ignored her. In spite of the fact that this woman was frequent in her asking, this man ignored her still. But eventually, the Bible says she got on his now. And the, and the man said, I do not fear God. I do not fear man. He said, but this woman is bothering me. I am going to see that she gets the justice for she is wearing me out from her constant coming to me. This is the story that Jesus was telling. Now look at verse 6. Then the Lord said, if even an evil judge can be worn down like that, don't you think that God will surely give justice to his people who plead with him day and night? Mm. Verse 8. Yes, he will answer them quickly. But the question is this. Mm. When the Messiah returns, how many will I find who have faith and are still praying? Mm. That is the question tonight. How many people are still praying? How many people are still holding up? How many people decide in their mind that when they are knocking a door, they will not leave that door until it opens? How many have determined that when they are seeking, they will not stop to seek until they find? How many have decided that they will keep on asking until they receive? Jesus Christ said that is how prayer is. And that was why Jesus Christ was successful when he was here on earth. Because he never gave up on prayer. 
anything he took to God, he prayed until he got the answer. And he's teaching us the principle that men ought always to pray and not to faint and not to give up. There will always be reasons to faint. There will always be reasons to, to, to give up. But the kind of prayer that Jesus is telling us to pray or the kind of prayer that we, we operate in this life that we have in this new man, Christ, that he gave to us is a persistent prayer. So in all things, we pray. And as we pray, we pray more. And then we pray more. And then when we are discouraged, we pray. And when we are distressed, we pray. And we feel bad, we pray more. We feel discouraged, we pray. We feel like giving up, we pray. When we get to that, the Bible says nothing shall be impossible for us to do. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And that is the army that God is going to raise in this church. Amen. Not because we are strong. Not because we have muscles to flex. But because we decide to persist in the place of prayer. We will pray when we feel like praying. We will pray when we don't feel like praying. We will pray when we are sleeping. Pray when we are tired. Pray when we are sleeping. Pray when we are awake and pray and pray. Amen. And we will get answers. Amen. Because we already know how to pray. Jesus has taught us how to pray. We pray the way he prayed it. We get the result that he got. Praise the Lord. Because upon the earth, we are Christ. The corn of wheat fell into the ground and became many. I am one of it. You, 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 you. We are all the same. Christ. Praise the Lord. Amen. And that's why Jesus Christ said, greater work shall you do. Because when he was here, he was only one. Suddenly he is gone. Many Christ. The devil turns here and sees one Christ. Turns here and says, ah, where am I going to go? Christ, 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 everywhere. When we all stand up to be the new man that we are, we are terror to the enemy. Then when we join force together, he cannot penetrate. Praise the Lord. Let us stand up on our feet.